It is December the 22nd, 2023, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Almost, almost, almost Prezi time. <laughs> it is almost Prezi time. <laughs> oh, we, we get we get this twice at this time of year because it's my son's birthday as well. So we had that oh. already. And no, no, uh, it's good. It's all right. It's is all right. he, no, is he, he feels gypped. extra he presents? Because I know no, someone that who we was always was always very disappointed. Because no, no, we we keep it separate. And then there's always that little bit where Emma and I just take a moment to say, "Well done, my love, for keeping a child alive for another year." <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yes. <laughs> All right. Which, which we used to do in secret, but now we just do it in front of the kids. They don't mind. <laughs> yeah, after a certain age, they kind of don't yeah, yeah, care that much be. anymore. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, it's our, yeah, this is our last episode of the year. Maybe. Um, no, no it is the last episode. We will record another one in the year, oh, but that will, won't come out right. until next oh, time. Oh, I stand it, corrected. I stand so corrected. News this from is, behind the curtain. This is, this, is, this is the magic time shift technology that we have here in the, in the technology land. Um, yeah, we thought it would be nice to look back at the year and pick out, each of us pick out a few things that we liked most or remember most or enjoyed most are you saying and look look to the past to infuse the future <laughs> yes exactly something like that something, something like, like that. that and and it doesn't have really my mine <clears throat> at least don't really have anything to do with the future um well maybe maybe not let's let's just let's just get started um sure. adrian i'll pick one of each of us and then we'll just take turns after that so um first one adrian you brought us crafts i did so this is my biggest photography project of the year so i thought yeah i thought to myself well what have, what what have i been doing photography wise this year and uh actually i picked this one out this this is a life affirming moment right so this craft website that you're scrolling here now you've heard me mention several times before the, this is uh this is emma my wife my better half this is her website for her craft shop and we have worked together uh throughout the year on and off uh sometimes in in quite intense bursts of productivity to do all the product photography for the store and uh, that's been brilliant. Um, that's been a new, a new discipline, a new genre of photography for me. Not really done product photography before. Never had a need to. Uh, and it's been a team, husband, wife, team working thing, which comes with all of the uh, challenges and joys that such things bring with them. Uh, and uh, yeah, we get to we get to the point at the end of the year, and there's loads of stuff that we've done together, and loads of imagery, loads of photos for all the products in the store, and that feels really, really good. So it's definitely a life affirming moment for me to have done that this year. So, so um, is it? um considered a catalog an online catalog so uh, i i was totally uh, catalogs for me you know go back to you know childhood and and for you know big big thick things that look like telephone books if anybody remember what a phone book <laughs> looks like we need to i need to different this metaphor is, is there any catalog. such thing that gets printed <laughs> that's that big anymore i don't think there is is there what's so Ulean. here in, in the US, there's a catalog called Ulean, which is everything associated with shipping products, which is cardboard, right. tape, um, oh, box different box. sizes, oh, right. packing stuff, but it, it's extremely awesome. thick and it's, you just can't put it down. It's I would bad. love that. That would be for me like flicking through the Radio Spares catalog. I'm that sure would you be, can get one absolutely awesome. free, even in Europe or England no longer part of europe um yeah. <laughs> we, have a, we have a tool a tool maker big big tool maker here who makes like all sorts of chisels and yeah. screwdrivers those are, those are fun those are fun oh, they're yeah. it's like I going to a stationary store um oh yeah uh, speaking of of kind of representational photography we'll, we'll give it that um i i saw a book um recently a small publication um, is there one press. of your one of your picks here? No. No, 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 no. It's just this reminded me of someone who decided they didn't really want to do all that much in terms of throwing everything they have out 
but they were just over cluttered. So they took it upon themselves to photograph every single thing that they have and put it into a book. Like the, every article of clothing, every little tchotchke. <laughs> and it's a fascinating um, read, if you will. Um, because once you, you know, you think, oh, why am I holding on to all of this? Well, part of it is this emotional connection we have to stuff, whether it be, you know, on a cerebral level books or, you know, just something that reminds us of something, something comforting in terms of our past, uh, or something that provokes some hope in terms of the future. But in photographing it and putting into a, basically a life catalog, they get to carry it around. They don't need the stuff anymore. That was the premise, anyway. Just thought I would. I would <laughs> mention that's, that's that a really. It's a really it. interesting idea. I lo I would love to have you know a printed catalogue or something. Yeah, that that it, that would it, it would fulfil probably a nostalgic role in my yeah, life. You know, exactly. when such things were you know, were, were around. But uh, yeah, I don't be good, but it feels good to. It is an online catalog. The stuff that we've done together this year, and it's yeah, and it yeah, it, it's it's just something different. It's creative in its own way. It's it's not. It, it's interesting. It's been interesting for me to work on photography that was not my um, my imagery. If you, if that makes sense, it's, it wasn't my my mental image that that drove that. It wasn't my um my aesthetic that drove that there was a you know so it, in some ways it's the first time i've ever had a client for my photography so that's an interesting and um, and i must say you, you did a really good job keeping the consistency between because you didn't shoot all these pictures at the same time so you uh, you you kept them visually consistent and uh and uh, and the art in, one thing in, in product photography that i really think is real art is making it look casual which takes mm -hmm. the most work because, well, because it, it takes work. Yeah. It is. It's it's surprisingly hard work. So for yes. anybody that yeah. decides they're going to do something like this, it is it is yeah. hard well, as work. So, yeah, as someone who used to uh, direct television commercials, I can only remember yeah. shooting uh, a beer pour or a hamburger <laughs> and it taking pretty much all day. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> to do that one shot anyway all right yeah. i'll i'll grab the next slot um one of my favorite things from this year i think it extended in from last year into this year is the three-part uh video series uh of smarter every day about codex film production which again each of those episodes is almost an hour long and uh the, uh destin from from smarter every day he got access as deep as he wanted and people were explaining everything in detail so you get the it starts from it starts from making the film base out of plastic gran granules uh into coding into uh putting the holes the sprocket holes into the film into packing it into uh getting it ready for sale the whole process is so well documented in this uh series and the people, you can tell the people who do this are, they love what they do. They have been doing this for their entire life. And they just, they, they still, still after these many years get to play with the most amazing machinery um, every day. So one of my favorite things from this year. That's how it sounds good. I mean, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's a mind boggling amount of stuff, isn't it? Right. You know, and uh the the science of it the engineering yeah. of it the attention yeah. to detail the the yeah the experimentation angle of it it's it's a phenomenal thing and it, it, it also makes... puts into perspective the when when we casually talk about a new film uh that Harmon brought out the phoenix film by the way uh, mm -hmm. two boxes arrived uh two two, hey, two rolls cool. arrived uh today so i'll be shooting that soon but the it just takes a lot to make color yeah, film. Does it, does it then kind of worry you, us, that um, if one of those spare parts of those very rare machines goes out, like, 
one thing you learn here is that because because that production has shrunk quite a bit since mm -hmm. the 90s, since the mid 90s, um, they do have spare parts because they have multiple of those machines that they don't use anymore because they don't produce as much anymore. So yes, they do, but there that's is diminishing space. returns, right? In other words, oh, we've used up all our spare parts. Do we have to start manufacturing new machines? Is that worth it? And can we see the end of film from where we are now? No, not yet. Not yet. It doesn't feel like, well, I mean, <laughs> things will, might come to us. I mean, I hope oh. not ever, but. There's... We don't know. Uh, Jeremiah, you brought us uh, The New Yorker. Yeah, this was just a wonderful piece on, obviously, the year in New Yorker photography. And it is so um, eclectic, interesting. Um, their choices are absolutely dazzling, and, and given our kind of where we sit in photography relative to AI image generation, which is becoming more and more like photography in terms of its response or our response to it, uh, th these are masterful works, each one varied and um, beautifully rendered. And I encourage people just to take a look at it because it, it does give you um, a look at photography in a consistent way that is just pure expression, and it's very inspiring. I like it when people, people who deal with photography every day um, get the... I, I suppose it's it's the, the, their picture desk who who had a lot of say here, and they they got pretty free choice of what they wanted to put in this article. So. They do, and all, all of those pieces were somehow integrated into articles in the New Yorker, which yes. is a really really wonderful magazine and um, very well thought through. It's not just random or it's not pro provocative for its own sake. Um, it's well considered as their photography is, so recommended highly. So we are doing the Our Favorites episode and they did their Our Favorites article. That's right. So it's sort of a little bit elliptical, which is my favorite end of year is their end of year favorite. All right. Um, Adrian, you uh, put in Making Time for Photography as we travel and I'm trying to find the accompanying photo, but I can't. Oh, it's in our, it's in our uh, shared photo album. I don't find it in there. So there's some sync issue here. Oh, okay. Apologies. Uh, it was a shot. So uh, I will describe it. Um, we, uh, I, I, everybody's heard me talk a lot about a trip I made to Canada this year. Earlier in the year, though, before we went to Canada, we went to Rome. Um, and Rome is an amazing city. Um, I know you, you've both spent time there. Uh, and it is a, a fantastic place. And um, uh, the photo I was sharing was just a little simple thing. There was a little, um, a little, cobbled street in the center of the the old city of rome and uh, i'm sure you can picture it with some uh some groceries some you know, sort of fruit and veg outside it and you walk into the store and it's all built into one of these big old blocks uh that are big old buildings that they have there some of which go back literally hundreds of years and it, in, in one of the rooms in this supermarket, because it was just with the bottom of a building converted into a shop, uh, there was a lovely painted ceiling above a, uh, above a stack of shelves that sold things like sugar and flour and stuff like that. And I thought, <laughs> only in Rome. So I, I crouched down. I got a wide lens and I crouched down near the floor so that I could capture the shelving as well as the ceiling. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it was just a shot like that. It's just a, a memory type shot, really. Something but that caught my eye. But um, certainly a great photo. Uh, oh, I, it, I, I saw the preview fly by. Now I still can't too. find it, but uh, yeah. but it's it's one of these things that I, I love that when I'm somewhere where I'm not usually not um, to not just see things and go, oh, that's neat, but to follow that impulse and and kind of make it into its own little piece of art. Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, I think, uh, I guess this is, I suppose you could part in, uh, think of this as a sort of you know, gratitude thing in a way, um, but really just uh, the amazing opportunities to travel and to see things and, and to, to ha take some time out wherever you are uh, to, to just, you know, see things, really see things uh, and, you know, 
yeah. I often think, uh, probably say it quite often as well, that actually, you know, photography has, has really sort of taught me to see the world in a completely different way than before sure. I did, before I picked up a camera and appreciate all of that more. So it's just, yeah, one of my favorite things is just to, to be able to see stuff and to take photographs that are just of, of the, just of the world, right? They don't have, well, not yeah. all of it has to be art. <laughs> well, I think being able to see things that we take for granted in a new way is one of the principal um, kind of effects of having a photo practice, I'd say, is just going out into the world. I think we did that piece a few weeks ago on unremarkable photograph. In other words, yes. the aesthetic of the mundane. Um, that attaches myself, straight to this one, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I continue shoot shoot to sh I continue shooting those kinds of images because they 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 surprise me and they entertain me uh, and they're ironic and they help me understand that there is no such thing as really something mundane. It's really how we see it. It, it, and it is. is, and it's really important, I think, because when I was trying to put together my three things for today's show, and I was thinking, well, uh, what 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 camera have I been interested in this year, and and what photography event have I been and uh, interested in this year? And there were, uh, you know, uh, a couple of things that I thought of, and I know, but but really, my photography this year, I'm very pleased to say, has been a really personal thing. Right. It's been uh, and when I was thinking back on my, the highlights of my photographic year, it's not been oh that time I really wished I could go out and shoot more. But instead, all I could do was watch a YouTube video. No, no, no offense to those of you that have chosen YouTube videos as inspiration for this show, of course, because, the, you know, uh, but the it's it, it's just actually you know, the thing that stuck out at me was, you know, was was some of the photography that I did. And I thought okay it may not you know it may not mean much to anybody else but hopefully my enthusiasm for it comes across <laughs> one one thing that i found and this is not a pick but uh, just just a side note here uh recently someone sent me a link to a website that you can uh point your your lightroom catalog at and it will do statistics over your lightroom catalog so um, that was an interesting look back because some, sometimes you can't see the patterns, but someone else can or something else can. And in future might as well be AI um, to find patterns. But um, I found that, oh, yes, I'm really set in my ways because my favorite, my by far most used focal length is 24 millimeters, which I kind of knew. Um, and my most used aperture is F8. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah, and and I tend to use my what is it the seventy to three hundred. Um, I used I I tend to use that pretty much almost only at its at its extremes, not in the middle. So as we do. All right, my my next pick is another video. Um, that okay. I love I love me a good mystery, a good detective story, a good trying to find uh, patterns and things and um that's a thing from when was that i, I discovered it, it this year it's kind of it's two years old but i discovered it during this year and it's this story about um skies in pictures i think we talked about it here briefly mm -hmm. so someone someone looked at through old postcards from the 60s and 70s and it turns out that a lot of these postcards feature as if they're landscapes, they feature the identical same sky. And Do they? We're, we're talking, we're talking hundreds of different postcards from different places, not just like like these these uh, I was in such and such postcards, you know, or the, of the new uh, public pool, of the new something, something stuff like like the postcards that you buy at attractions and so on and it turns out yeah a lot of these have the exact same sky in them and there's there's a that's a little investigation in that video about how why 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 where <laughs> does well, how did this happen and i'm not gonna tell you you mm -hmm. have to watch it but it's one of these fun stories and it's about photography so uh, it's really exciting to do you know that. in filmmaking there is a similar um the wilhelm scream the wilhelm scream of course yes. 
<laughs> I know. I know. Um, um, there's 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 a lot of things that are that are put in there as I think the William Scream is more of a that's not even an homage. It's kind of a uh, it's a quirk. Uh, it's it's it, an Easter egg that they put in. It's an Easter egg. Uh, you know, I personally have used it in <laughs> several series. Of I, course, I, I would uh, just for the fun of it. I mean, to track yes. your history. <laughs> but those, <laughs> but those guys are not an Easter egg. That's the interesting part. It's not someone just being funny or. or no, but wh what guy? Who took the original? Where is it from? And how does it integrate? This so is that's exactly what this yeah, video is great. about. <laughs> I'm going to go watch it. Definitely, that sounds. Like you've got me in, in in intrigued now. All right, Jeremiah, you brought us. Oh, oh, oh! I knew this was this was going to happen. AI. Yes, but but I wanted to talk about it in a slightly different way. Um, this era they <laughs> that they're touting as Gemini era from uh, Microsoft is is really Google. about Google. Google Deep Mind, oh, sorry, yeah. um, it's really about multimodal, and I wanted just briefly say that we are entering into yeah. a uh, a world um in ai generation whether it's visual sonic writing whatever that is multimodal where in the machine can interpret music sound visuals um drawings and and really understand the basis of that. And soon we will be able to cross-pollinate. This is what I believe, talking about the future, is if you play some notes in a tune and ask AI to generate an image based on the mood of the music and then in, extrapolate a drawing of that and maybe tell a story, There there are... Things that are on the horizon in terms of multi-modality, um, wherein the integration of all things, I'm going to call it aesthetic, but, but it's certainly broader than that because it could be math, it could be science, it could be anything. But feeding, feeding information writ large into a machine and having it understand not only the subject, but the actual context and what happens when we start to mash these things up? In other words, what's the relationship between a piece of music and uh, and a photograph? Um, what is the relationship between a story and a potential soundtrack to that story written? Yeah. So multimodality is something to keep an eye on as it evolves. Currently, it's really just at the very base root, which is now the machine understands the difference between music and writing and visuals and vectors and graphics, etc. Um, but it's coming. And, and it can do things with it. And uh, I, we're still only seeing an early glimpse of it, but uh, yeah. I, ju I just recently got a, a, a letter by someone and I wanted to make that into like, by a business and i wanted to quickly make this into an address book entry and i took a photo and fed it into chat gpt and told it to uh, make me a vcf file that i can then double click and import into my uh, contacts and it did it did yeah yeah so <laughs> yeah i mean i i, I i'm and this is and this is early days in the future this... you will you will just tell it oh put this put this in my no remember this that's it and then that's it yeah it'll and, do the and right. it'll figure out how to remember it where your best yeah. recall would be but again multimodality is really my choice not a yeah. specific to gemini yeah it's it's about that integration of understanding and where that will lead us into the future of art and science mm -hmm. and well, philosophy well, I'm glad we're talking about AI, right? Because it has, it would be, oh, it would seem odd. Thing, it would seem yeah. odd for an end of 2023 show to not <laughs> talk about AI, right? Yeah. So, really, really. Uh, and not just because the three of us have enjoyed exploring it over the year and you know and talking about it, but it, it is change. It is here, and it is changing things, and it is only very early days. And as powerful as these things are, they are, of course, the worst they'll ever be. They're going to get better and better and better, yeah. whatever better means. Probably worse and worse and worse as well, whatever worse means. That's okay, though. We'll roll with it. But I think I think one of the things that I'm 
uh, you know, we, now we're a year and a bit into this whole uh, you know, AI hype, you know, uh, that, that's been going on since. Uh, and I market, I tend to market from about the launch of GPT rather than any of the image generating engines that existed before that, because that was when the real sort of public hype started. The I think for me, we're already past peak trauma in in terms of people reacting to or photographers especially there's a lot of stuff that people you know, a lot of conversations this year about oh is is this the death of photography well for me it's just like well, well no the the death of photography will be if you just keep talking about the death of photography and stop going out and taking photos but the the i think it, it was nice to sort of come through that and understand you know the as as ever, um, yeah. The, well, I can't remember what the the French phrase is. Is it plus ça change, même le change? Plus ça change. Like um, yeah. Plus ça reste le même. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, more things the, change, the more they stay the same. Exactly. Yeah. Because for me, as great as and as powerful as the AI tools are, they they are no substitute for wandering around with a camera in your hand or or setting yourself a creative project and executing it. And, and stuff like that, I think. Yeah. I mean, you can if I had a beef, do. Adrian, if I had a beef, is that uh, people are still calling themselves, oh, I'm an AI artist, or I did this with this tool. And I, f I find that to be um, ridiculously and... I think it, the, it, I think the, 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 job, the job of prompt engineer is one of the most short-lived jobs that we've ever had <laughs> sure so you know have you ever uh speaking about multimodal you feed an image into you know bing have it describe it then have the description adjusted for a prompt then take that prompt and rewrite it yourself and then generate an image and then have it described again that kind of loop creates some very interesting processes and also, it doesn't matter what tools anyone uses. It's what comes out. Does it provoke a response? And is it consistent? Sure, anyone can make a, a, a doodle, a, a, you know, like my three-year-old can paint that Jackson Pollock. Right? <laughs> but if your three-year-old made enormous Jackson Pollock-sized paintings, like 50 of them, You'd be a very wealthy person because you could probably have a show at Pace or one of the bigger galleries and and say, from the mind of this genius three-year-old comes these incredible... Of course, they don't go to school or anything. All they do is paint. But, um, so tool, tools are just that. They are just tools. And, and as we kind of embrace tools, I think um, the more we fight them, uh, the less we understand them. And the more we embrace them, the deeper we can integrate them in our processes. So, if anything at all, everyone should be at least develop a feeling what these things are. Yeah. And that means playing with them. Yeah. yeah. All right. Ijen, uh, you are, you brought us. Okay. Um, this, uh, unfortunately, Changes language depending on That's where cool. you are on the That's planet. That's all right. It's only uh, it's, it's only one website. Others are available. I um, so that uh, so this is this is my attempt to get excited about camera releases. Um, yeah, for the year. Uh, and uh, uh, this is um, MPB dot com, uh, which is a website that I use to buy second hand camera gear. Yeah. Uh, I also put a link in the notes to KEH because uh, you know, KEH is, is an equivalent, a um, uh, very long established uh, uh, business in, in the United States, of course. Uh, and I'm sure there are others in, in lots of other places. Um, but it's just, I think, for me, I think one of the turning points, maybe not, may, maybe not quite this year, but for me personally, I've started to exploit it this year has been the wide availability of very affordable and very sophisticated second-hand photographic equipment. Yes. Right, the fact that you know, and, uh, you, know, you can pick up now a 10-year-old camera and it would be perfectly acceptable to shoot for National Geographic, to shoot for 
um you know high fashion you know and, and uh i think that that's amazing and if you go back five years ago and then you look back 10 years behind there i don't think you could have said that that was true so i i it it it, it feels to me like the, there's just more than ever there is a, a wealth of digital photographic equipment that is very affordable um, uh, accessible to everybody uh, and you no longer need to spend thousands of pounds or dollars or euros to to get you know to, to get the tools to do the job and i would encourage everybody just to play right just to yeah you know, just to play around and you you can pick some things up for you know under a hundred dollars sometimes and in really peak condition and you know uh, available to just to play with and use and enjoy so well, that's something i've enjoyed doing this year that's funny because my pick is probably the complete opposite. It's the world's <laughs> most expensive camera ever made. Well, well, co coincidentally, uh, we on the on the Happy Shooting podcast here in Germany, we did uh, uh, just recently did an episode about used equipment, and we went through our own equipment and I picked a few things out. I still have it here because I didn't tidy up, but. Um, for example, my, all my multiple tilt shift lenses, none of them is new. All of them are bought used because, and this kind of stuff you cannot even get new is a big, a big 30 millimeter RSAT lens for mm. a medium format camera. That's the kind of stuff that is only available used. So yeah, there we are. All right. Uh, let's see. I have another one, and that is not a photography thing. <clears throat> well, it, it, it kind of is, kind of is, because um, it's a museum. I love interesting museums, as in strange, weird kind mm -hmm. of things. This one is um, one that uh, Monica and I visited sometime in summer this year. And it is, uh, here in Germany, it's called <clears throat> the Verstärkeramt, which is uh, a museum disguised as a northern German farmhouse, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And I've probably talked about it here. It's um, pretty much uh, used to, well, it, it was built in the Third Reich. It was built by the Nazis as an underground a uh, phone and tel telex line amplification site. So in order to stretch over vast distances, they had to have these amplifiers in the middle and um, and uh, pretty much yeah amplify the signals. And uh, in order to hide that, they put it two floors underground in a bunker-like system and put a farmhouse on top so no one would notice. And um, it's now a, a museum of old studio, radio, TV technology. So there is some visual aspect to this for sure. Uh, it's pretty much 150 year and years and more of, um, of telecommunications to technology. And it was just so amazing because it's a place that is now run by uh by a by a club of like 20 people who uh, yeah well, you, you just go there it's very, very unassuming cool. it's very unassuming very cool. you open the door to the farmhouse and all you see is a staircase that leads into a dark tunnel so yeah see i'm i'm, I'm with you cuz i love obscure museums uh, there's one here not even that far from where I live, called the Museum of Jurassic Technology. I heard about this yesterday you, on a podcast. Yesterday on a podcast. Is, <laughs> if you, like, it, it's worth a visit every year. I mean, it's easy for me. But, I mean, th this is like, um, you know, the Bible on the head of a pin. I <laughs> think you have yeah. a, you know, microscope to look at it. The most bizarre collections, um, it's just worth looking at. It's almost impossible to describe how obscure the work is within this. Um, it's just dazzling. And on the flip side, I remember we were, Sue and I were traveling down through the south, and um, there was a museum uh, called the, the Buford Pusser Museum. Now, I don't know if you remember this movie called Walkin' Tall, but it's it's kind of a not a B maybe a C movie about a 
corrupt sheriff who just beat people <laughs> with a bat, and they made a movie of him. And and he's sort of a very low and mythic, obscure uh, character made famous by this obscure movie. And his old house has been turned into a museum, and it it is like the day he left. Like nothing is nothing is touched. His the bats that he used, the old TV, the radio, the bed, the bedspread. And it's it's run again by a collective of people. There they charge you, you know, like six dollars to walk around the house, and then the pictures on the wall. It's a museum of a man's life who you know. He died in a car crash and the, the smashed cars in the garage. I mean, uh, you can't make this That's stuff a bit up. strange. <laughs> in American so so I, I do, uh, I do like obscure museums myself. And uh, if you're in LA, you must go to the Museum of Jurassic Technology, though, because it is uh, inspiring. I I do recommend. So I, I told you I, I I heard about this on a podcast yesterday, yeah. and I want I want to um, tell everyone Funny. what that podcast episode is because it was wonderful. Um, it's okay. the and maybe wag. put it in the notes. Yeah, yeah, we will. It's the Chinwag podcast with Paul Giamatti. He has a podcast uh, which mm. I didn't know, and uh, his guest is Neil Gaiman. And they, oh, nice. the author, yeah. so they, they end up talking about all sorts of things, but they also talk for, uh, for a while about obscure museums and the, the museum of Jurassic technology comes up and they go into quite some detail and it's, uh, it's amazing. So, uh, Chinwag yeah, is the podcast and the episode just recently released, uh, I think two episodes with uh, Neil Gaiman around mid December. So Go check that out. Mm. Um, worth it. All right. Last but not least, you, Jim, and I picked one that I wanted to pick, but then I saw that you already picked it. So um, <laughs> here we go. Uh, in, yeah, in, an interesting yeah, camera. I just thought this is the world's most expensive camera, <laughs> yes. not available at KEH. The least serviceable <laughs> camera. Um, that's right, and I'm 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 wondering also if just because of the state of the world, this will be not only a, an amazing camera, but one of the last of its kind because of the, you know, the the expense and the political um, position on science lately, and the amount that you would have to spend to make this even you, more amazing. You are, of course, talking uh, but, about a telescope. Yeah. The, the, the images that are coming, there was just an image of Pluto that was released this week. Ah, uh, the, the Uranus image. I mean, you're, yeah, Uranus. The, yeah. With the rings. Um, oh, that was amazing. That's right. Amazing. Oh uh, things we've never seen before. Um, every day there's something new to see. And, you know, it's a futurist camera, but it looks to the past. This is the closest we come to traveling back in time to see the origin of the universe and our very, very um, minuscule role in it. Uh, Look at that. Uranus with rings. I've, I've never seen it like that. No. So. And, and again, you could only imagine if you doubled and tripled the, I guess, <laughs> the, the amount of pixels. <laughs> I don't know. Um, what you would get when this becomes sharper and deeper into space, um, what will we see? What will we discover? Yeah. So this is this is photography at its finest, I think. Oh, and and uh, interestingly enough, it is very scientific, but it also yields art. Yeah. If you look at these things, it's just it's wild. It is yeah. wild. All yeah. right. Yeah. That was that was twenty twenty three, and uh, we are we are um, ending the year with this episode. Um, next one might have a bit of a lookout into the next year, possibly. So, thanks to you for being on this show for the entire year, and. Uh, yeah, that brings us to the end. So you can, of course, find us at thefuturephotography.com. 
join our Discord. We are still um, on our Discord, sharing photos, discussing topics on tfttf.com slash join tfop. Link is in the show notes. Um, check out our photos, including Adrian's ceiling in the supermarket in Rome. When it synchronizes. When it's in- <laughs> If it synchronizes, it should. It should. It's just my computer being very slow. All right. That was it. Thanks, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. Till next time. Bye-bye. 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 You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.